I'd like to invite our next few panelists up here, please. Could I invite, of course, John Gloucester up again, where he'll be joined by our next panelist, Ryan Fernando, who's a sports nutritionist and co-founder of Qua Nut Nutrition. Dr. Santosh Jacob is an orthopedic surgeon with a specialization in arthroscopy and sports medicine. And our fourth panelist, Sujit Somsundar, is a former India cricketer and currently works as a high performance and mental toughness coach. The discussion is going to be moderated by Go Sports Foundation Program Director Sai Sudha Sugavanam. Before I start, I would like to set some context for today's discussion. Sports successes are not created just by individuals. Behind every successful sports person, there's a team, often invisible. While coaches are the universe, form the universe for an athlete, there are sports science experts like uh, physios, nutritionists, doctors, psychologists, strength and conditioning coaches who work tirelessly to bring out the best in an athlete. We are here today to discuss the Indian context of sports science, how sports science can be used to bring out the best from an Indian athlete. Uh, in the next 30 minutes or so, we would be discussing where does India stand with, re with respect to sports science and um, you know, how you all approached sports science and to get better, what should India do and what are the avenues for Indian sports scientists to upskill themselves. Also, I would also like to touch upon what we do right in India because more often than not, when we discuss sports system in India, it, it, it tends to become pessimistic. Uh, so John, I would like to start with you. You briefly touched upon your experience in India during your talk. You joined the Indian cricket team in 2005 and you've been part of the IPL as well. Um, what, as an outsider, when you first came into India, what was your initial observation uh, of the sports system in India as such? Um, I was very fortunate because I came in through the top door, not the back door, the top door through Bangladesh. I had four years within uh, Bangladesh cricket before I came to Indian cricket. So I'd had an experience of a system that perhaps was not at its best and, a, and an evolving system that they just developed. Um, so I came into a pretty, uh, pretty well-developed first-class cricket structure, pretty well-developed um, uh, administrative structure, but an okay developed um, sports science or sports medicine support structure. Prior to that, I'd been in England with cricket for four years. So at a very high level of development in those systems. But coming into India, it was more the, it wasn't through a lack of effort or through a lack of um, um, understanding, it was more in the communication between the, the, the bodies, the governing bodies. Um, in those days, it was the, the, the physio with the national team and then the associations, but then the NCA was in, was in practice as well. The problem was, was the communication between all the bodies was, was where the, the problems lay. And, and a lot of the injury issues that we had in those days was purely because there was not enough um, adequate feet on the ground at the association level as well as at the NCA level to implement the strategies that we knew would work once they got to the international system or the international scene. So I think that's evolved and I think that they've now uh, in a position where you could probably say it's working. Um, I think the strategy and the system that's in place now with, with, uh, with a senior physiotherapist, Patrick Farhad at the top, managing the international athletes, then with, the, um, with the, uh, Andrew Lepus coming into the NCA system and managing the education side, uh, which then is dissipates to the association level. So I think they've now got the system in place and I think it's working. We can learn from that system and extrapolate that to other sports as well. Again, part of my talk was about let's look to other sports to see what works and what doesn't work. If it's not working, then we move on. We look at something that is. But I think the system that's in place now, especially from the education front, which is the key, is in place and is certainly starting to work and will work going forward. So maybe other sports can look at the structure that BCCI has um, and, and move that one into their system. Thanks, John. Uh, cricket is a fairly evolved sport in India. Uh, Ryan, if I can ask you, you've worked with the likes of Sushil Kumar, Yogendra Dutt, uh, especially during their preparation to 2012 Olympics. Uh, can, you throw, uh, can you share your experience working with 
um, the, uh, uh, the wrestlers and also how sports nutrition has evolved over the years in India. Uh, so, the classical thing with the Pelwan in India is that wrestling is a huge amount of ghee, which is your saturated fat. And uh, if you notice, uh, Sushil and Yogendar, these guys represent Indian poster boys today with six packs. And uh, I, one thing that you said, you know, we're always pessimistic. I've got to appreciate the coaches. I remember, I know that his real coach is, is Yashvir Singh. Okay, and I remember re meeting Yashvir Ji at Patiala, and he said, you know, when we go to Cuba and we watch these guys and they're doing their nutrition like this, ye time par ye kha rahe, they eat all of these things and all, but in India we have no system. So let's do some system. So the good part about that was the openness in 2005, okay, uh, or 2005 or 2006 when I met them, to start changing the traditional ways of eating. And there was one philosophy, oh, we are vegetarian. Should we ask these boys to change? We are Hanuman Bhakt. I said, no. You know, there's this huge misnomer that the Indian diet is wrong. I think the cultural choices and the not having the correct understanding, as, as Sir said earlier, which is um, you need to know what is your training load. And he spoke, he spoke specifically about the exertion and you know the 75% you're doing training. So athletes today, first of all, don't know how much they're expending in calories. And then at the second level, how much to consume. So at that time, I remember we didn't have all of these energy trackers and also we were using our traditional formulas for calculating calories, the catch, you know, okay, this is the body weight, this is the lean body mass or the fat percentage. And you know, they're doing the pinch calipers, asking the physio, give us this level, and then guesstimating calories, and then breaking them down. I remember Shushil Kumar's first uh, diet chart, if I may say, was written on a serviette. Okay, so I sat down there and wrote this, this, this. And then he was amazed that he was doing this much in terms of eating. He was training maybe this much, okay? And then the diet that I was giving him was about here, as compared to here. So we, we had to align all of that. But the good part about the modern day athlete and technology and coaches today that I am seeing, I've been in this now for 15 years. Uh, I remember meeting John in Bombay, I think at the um, uh, Mumbai uh, cricket grounds. And from there till today, you can see cricket changing, you can see badminton changing, you can see hockey changing, you can see every game changing. So they know what they need to do. What's missing is uh, who are the right individuals to go to uh, and we need to create those right individuals around at least 10,000 of them to help all of these athletes. So that's very important at the grassroots level. Nice. Uh, nice to hear that things are changing. Um, Sujit, you have been a cricketer yourself and now you're a cricket coach and a mental conditioning expert. So how has sports psychology evolved in India? I mean, from your playing days to what it is today? Definitely, it has improved. Uh, when, when I played uh, for India, I played a couple of games. I think I didn't have the, you know, uh, enough support in that area because, uh, because the demands of the game is so high. Uh, we just don't have access to people who would uh, also, uh, you know, condition you mentally. What is it that you're going to face? Uh, but right now, it has changed. In the team, Indian team, there wasn't any uh, psychologist or a mental conditioning coach. Uh, but right now, of course, uh, Paddy Upton uh, has done a great job. It's very important. Uh, the awareness has gone up. And some of the sports uh, bodies have recognized that, and they have the sports psychologists there. And that's good. But otherwise, I think that's one of the most uh, neglected sports science areas, if, if I may say so. Uh, Dr. Santosh, if I can get your perspective on how sports medicine in India has evolved. I think... I, I think the way that sports medicine has evolved is that we've got pockets of excellence, but like Ryan and John touched upon, uh, most people don't know who to go to with what particular problem. And so I think the way it needs to evolve in future is so that we have a system in place whereas each and every athlete at every level, from the elite to the grassroots to the school kids, should have a go-to person for their problem and they should know who that person is uh, whether it's a doctor or a physio or a if the problem is nutrition nutritionist whatever it is 
they need to know who their go-to person is so that they're not, and what we find at the moment is people hunting and hunting and then ending up shopping around for people to try and find the solution to their problem. So I think that's where it needs to go. At the moment, there are people who are excellent, world-class, and I don't see a need actually for, you know, at least our elite athletes to have to go abroad for medical treatment, whether it is surgery or rehab. But, you know, they are isolated. So the connection between the, the population that needs the help and the population that's able to give the help is not there, or the structure is not there in place for that. Okay. Uh, John, if I may ask you, uh, you've, you're from Australia and you've spent uh, many years in India as well. So how would you compare the two systems and what, what are the best practices that India can adopt from Australia? Yeah, I've always said you can't, you can't just transfer a system and, and, and put it somewhere else and expect it to work, you know, especially in a country like India or on the subcontinent because of the cultural differences. But um, I agree, you know, I think, I think we've got stuff right. I really do. We do have world-class surgeons in this country, outstanding surgeons, and there's some great specialised clinics as well now in the sports medicine field. Um, it's access. Um, and it's also communicating between those those facilities amongst themselves, and I talked about that before, is we've got to be open to communicating amongst ourselves. Um, I don't think we do that well enough, because until we do that, we're never going to grow. But I think, you know, in terms of what we have, I think we've got some outstanding, especially in the, in the orthopedic uh, world. Um, coming into India now, some brilliant musculoskeletal radiologists. There's one from Bombay who I work with. Like I said, he's, he's, as a professional, he's my best friend. I mean, he has to be. You've got to align yourself with these people. Um, but for the everyday athlete, access is the big issue. Yes, they're here, but there's one in Bombay, there's one in Bangalore, there's one in Delhi. Um, but at the grassroots level where this intervention is most important, it's not accessible. And that is the biggest problem. And I think that's the, the hole that we need to fill. And that's what associations need to make access available, whether that be financially or however they can do it. Um, but for me, it's about education, and again, the SMASA representative is here, the CEO is here, because he feels it's the education front that is going to be most important for us going forward, and I totally agree with him. Yeah, great you touched upon education. I would like to ask all the panelists here today, I mean, if there's a sports scientist or a nutritionist in the country, uh, and if they want to specialize in sports nutrition or uh, sports psychology, physiology, medicine, what are the avenues that are available in India to upskill? So if I can start with Dr. Santosh. Uh, just before I come to that, uh, my best friend is a musculoskeletal radiologist as well. Uh, no, no, no. My best friend is. Oh, your uh, best friend. My, my wife. Yeah. <laughs> You're in big trouble. So... Um, yeah, uh, at the moment, the way the system is, is that there is no subspecialization of sports medicine in the country. There is uh, all sports science from my understanding. I actually did a, a Google search just to look and back up my reference. Uh, state of sports science in India. And the first thing that came up was sports science in India is in the Stone Age. That was the, that was the first thing that came up. And it's an interview from the Hindustan Times. So... That's pretty much where we stand at the moment. So honestly speaking, there is currently no real way we can upskill. Uh, I think we have a beginning here, and I think we need to take that forward very actively and aggressively. And uh, the other thing that we need to do is, and this is interdepartmental again, is to use SAI or one of those bodies to leverage the Medical Council of India to start creating bodies where sports science and sports medicine and sports physiology can be taught as specific subjects. Uh, I think it's the future. I think it's the only way to go. And I'm really, really hopeful that will happen soon. But I think we really need to use our contacts with one organization to leverage the other governmental organizations to try and get that off the ground. Uh, John, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, upskilling. And that, again, that was one of the key topics that I promoted in my talk. You know, how do we do it? It's very difficult here. And especially for international physios like myself, for me to be accredited and to ha maintain my license and to maintain my insurance, most people don't realize that I need to maintain a minimum $20 million insurance cover 
just to treat athletes in this country. I, but that has to come from externally. But in order to maintain my license, I need to get a certain number of CPD, continuing professional development points. Unfortunately, I can't get those points in India because none of the courses are accredited. And that's a real issue for me. It means that every time I have to travel overseas to attend courses and conferences to update my skills, to maintain my license, to maintain my, to maintain my insurance. So it's going to become a big issue. The more players that are being paid big, big money, the people treating them need to be insured, especially with the international leagues that are coming into the country. Now, if they're not skilled or upskilled appropriately, it's, it's, going to turn, uh, it's going to turn awful at some stage because there's going to be a case where someone will be treated by an athlete, uh, an athlete will be treated by someone who hasn't got the right accreditation, who hasn't got the right insurance, and it could, uh, it could turn into a very le a nasty legal mess. So upskilling is not only to protect your athlete, it's also to protect yourself, and it's also uh, to protect the profession. Unfortunately, that's where we have found, and we found there is a deficit in this country in sports medicine and sports physio. And again, we are finding or attempting to find ways to fill that hole. And we're, we're sort of venturing down that pathway at the moment. But it, is, it, it has been identified. I wouldn't say we're in the Stone Age. I don't agree with that because I think there are certain individuals who are placed appropriately around the country who we can access. The limiting factor is the financial one. Um, Ryan, what are your thoughts on this? So nutrition is one subject that even my mom is very well qualified as well as my wife, both are not nutritionists. And it's an easy subject, science, uh, in the base, you know, eat an apple. This, I, I think from a sports perspective, there are one or two colleges in India, one's in Bombay. And I have a, a privilege to have a team of 50 uh, nutritionists on my team. Some of them are extremely good. Uh, what I look for uh, is, uh, are they qualified with a master's degree in sports nutrition? There are avenues, but there's a little lacuna that the coaches need to understand and the panel also needs to understand nutrition. Sports is at a different level. It's like you're taking your normal daily vehicle and then you're going into Formula One with sports. Uh, for that, the sports nutritionist has to understand exercise physiology, <coughs> uh, your, your, your biochemistry, e even to the extent of biomechanics. And now the latest, which I'll talk later, is nutrigenomics, which is genetic testing and how nutrition affects the genes. Uh, Unfortunately, this domain of nutrition in India is held by people doing home science and nutrition, which is predominantly the women group. All my entire team of 50 dietitians are all women. About only 5% of them work out or played a game. So this is a lot of anxiety in terms of if there is to be continuing education, I think at the grassroots level, these specialists, male or female, need to be also understanding the rigors of sports either by playing or practicing it. Like uh, uh, John here would say that uh, domes, delayed onset of muscle soreness. Our nutritionists have to go to the gym. I call up the trainer and say, please make sure next day she's going to achieve domes. So she understand what's a player going through. So I think for us, continuing education is not an issue. You have the internet. Um, I continue, continue to correspond with the US. Yes, it is expensive and all to get my CEUs, like his CPD, so I have to get my CEUs. It is expensive. And then they ask you to get so many units to come for this convention, that convention. We Indians tend to skip that because just up and down alone is around four, five thousand dollars $5,000. Something like that needs to come into India, where Sports Authority of India or the Indian education system needs to get aggressive uh, nutritional practices in and small certification courses, because once you're in a job, uh, it's very difficult to get your employer to give you leave to go for two months, three months, unless it's, you know, the government. The government does give you extended, but private doesn't. So, yes, it can be done, but I, I think coaches need to watch out for the fact that one question you can ask as nutritionist is, uh, do you work out? So you understand that rigor in an athlete and how they are literally killing themselves every day. So then you understand that, okay, you know, after your exercise, you eat one egg, that should be enough. It doesn't match. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, Sujit, can you show, throw some light on sports psychology? Yeah, like I said before, sports psychology is something that uh, not too many people are aware of on, and the benefits of it. And it's a sports psychology uh, is a taboo, uh, I think, because people feel that if you go to a sports psychologist in India, then you're a mental case. 
and people don't want to be uh, you know labeled like that so that's something which happens on the side maybe if some people do go to a, a sports psychologist it's on the side behind uh, it's a quiet affair because of which uh, i think there are only two universities that offer sports psychology as a uh, as a subject psychologists yes clinical psychologists there are many but sports psychology as a specific uh, area of research or opportunity for people to become sports psychologists is very few i think there's one in tamil nadu university i've seen uh, that they offer sports psychology uh, as one of the subjects uh, one in punjab but other than that not too many uh, so the op like i said it's a, it's a matter of uh, supply and demand so there's not too much demand uh, or a sports psychologist in india or a mental conditioning coach is probably not someone who has a lot of people takers uh, so because of which the opportunities are less is unfortunate but uh, that's the way it is yes the awareness is going up uh, hopefully uh, in future there are more opportunities for people who are interested to really go upskill really go educate themselves in sports psychology there are more universities offering those uh, courses uh, and then uh, probably there are more athletes who would go to a sports psychologist uh, i mean now yes there is a lot of awareness for fitness if an athlete wants to perform or increase the level of performance they will go to a gym they go to a trainer right they they go because it's not like they are weak they want to go there because they want to get better but if they go to a sports psychologist they have their mental case so because of which they don't it's not it should be like if they want to really up their performance then they need to get help from all angles it's an interesting point i mean uh, all sports scientists play a very integral part in the in bringing out best from an athlete um what happens uh, more often than not is uh, coaches tend to become nutritionists psychologists fitness trainers physios do doctors nasiyas name it uh, which is good i mean uh, a sports i mean a coach spe uh, spends a lot of time with an athlete so they need to be aware of the sports science elements as well but when should a coach approach an expert um i would like to start with you john uh, um yeah the coach for me is the is the um is the umbrella that protects the athlete as an individual they've also got to understand that they have certain limitations in certain fields and and appreciating that is is, is the first thing discovering that you don't have the answer to everything and in the best interest of your athlete then you need to ask someone else um th so that's first of all so the, the number one role of a coach is to protect the athlete nurture them bring them through and it's about inputs but the inputs on on every one of these topics that we discuss can't come from one individual it's it's sad but it can't in in the case of, especially with individual sports it's different in teams but um so accessing the right people and knowing who to access to get that information to then impart to the athlete is where the skill lies and that's what good coaches do the best coaches in the world are the best man managers in the world you know they manage the individual but they're also open to the fact that somebody else can impart more information than they can on a particular topic and they must access that person it's not about the coach it's not about us it's not about all of us on this panel it's about the athlete and the question that you always have to ask yourself is what is in the best interest of my athlete and how do i go about um bringing people in who can give that athlete the best result so that's for me that's the function of a coach the technical stuff when they get to our level they're all brilliant technicians just fine tuning here and there and we have technical analysts to do all that but ultimately what separates the good athlete from the exceptional athlete is the ability of a coach to find those little buttons to push you know it was mentioned before finding that key to turn the lock you know that that's what the good coaches at that level do but you've got to know the athlete in order to find those buttons so that's developed over years and months of interaction and confidence and getting results and and being there for them and you know that's the other nitty gritty of it all but ultimately you are an umbrella that's the way i look at the coach okay um ryan with regards to sports nutrition you touched upon it briefly in the previous uh, answer as well but especially with regards to sports nutrition it's not just the coach alone the parents also come along i mean it's a very cultural issue cu cultural topic uh, in india i mean uh, how uh, how do you 
see yourself as a nutritionist? Do you in integrate into the cultural beliefs or do you work around it? Okay, so this is what, you know, if, when, when I talk to coaches or parents and why nutrition is important, I always say that you'll train once or twice a day, you'll have a shower once or twice a day, you'll take a dump once or twice a day, but you're going to, as an athlete, have to be eating five to eight times a day. So nutrition is really at the core uh, integral part of an athlete, and I think the next part is the brain, and then the muscle follows. And, and we're all in the business of creating greater and better muscles. The thinking comes from the athlete. And obviously, nutrition is what you, from your culture, what Dadi Ma, what the grandmother, or what the mother, whether you're a Tamilian Ayer or you're a Punjabi solid six footer. It, the cultural diversity is so different. People have these fixed mindsets on ghee and, and protein and vegetarianism. However, uh, I think the coach is one of those key persons that can change it. Because in Kwa Nutrition, every client that has come to us has been pushed by a coach or a very intellectual parent that says, you're eating this much, but I ate this much when you're your age, but I didn't train as much as you. So there is that gap. The problem comes in different types of parents. You get the helicopter parent. They'll come in the counseling, and they're telling you what the child should eat. Then you get the parent that's on the phone all the time, kind of like, oh no, he doesn't like this, he doesn't like that. And then you get the parent that doesn't turn up for the counseling. What we have discovered is the kid in nutrition that is left alone has the quickest compliance. I'll repeat, the kid that's left alone, the parent doesn't accompany, the kid then suddenly realizes this is my responsibility. That's my nutrition coach, I'm the athlete, I've got to listen to what he says. If he says beetroot is going to enhance my uh, oxygen carrying capacity and I hate beetroot, well, I'm just going to pinch my nose and find a way to down the beetroot juice. Parents. I personally believe should be the ones that pay the bills in the initial years, support the athlete mentally, help in the domestic uh, purchase of those products, guide the child, and if a child doesn't like something, help the child overcome, you know, those sort of things. Uh, the coaches are meeting the kid every day, and they are one barometer for me in terms of, Mr. Ryan, you told him to hydrate, He's got his personalized water bottle. It's one liter of um, glucose plus sodium plus potassium. And he's got his water bottle and he's got his dry fruit and maybe some banana. And he's swimming for three hours. I've got the whistle break, but he's forgot to carry it that day. So from that perspective, sports nutrition can fail even on a daily practice in spite of, let's say, coming to a nutritionist. Because you're doing it eight times a day, even one or twice in a day, if you fail to do the nutrition pro uh, not, not too well, you could end up going to John because there was not enough of hydration or nutrition that day. And that just could be that one day where you say, no, it's luck that my shoulder went off. And as a nutritionist, I say, better preparation in terms of a nutrition on a daily basis will get you there. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Sujit, uh, like I mentioned to Ryan as well, I mean, and you, uh, uh, parents also play an integral part when it comes to psychology of an athlete. They spend a lot of time with the athletes. Um, when should they reach out to a psychologist? Yeah, like I said, it, it has to be a system. I mean, people should not reach out when there's an issue. It should have happened already. There should be a team of people that, if you recognize that there is an athlete who has it in him or her, then he or she should have a system of experts, you know, to hone the skill or the performance. But unfortunately, since it isn't there, the coach, like all of us, uh, you know, discuss the coach's responsibility is to keep thinking what would push this athlete to higher performance. And when they really keep inquiring, then they'll know that these are the areas. I mean, it's an automatic thing that you have to reach out to a trainer because you have to become stronger to get better in terms of the performance and nutrition comes along with it, right? Training comes there. And if the athlete is performing, competing, then what is mental toughness? Uh, the edge, the mental edge that the athlete has over the opponent, just to deal with those situations and scenarios that are demanding. Uh, so if a coach sees that there are such certain uh, aspects of game where the game could have gone the other way, and if the athlete misses out, then they know that there is something that an athlete would require help in, and, and that's when they need to reach out. Uh, like you said, sports parenting is another area. Because now in India, because you don't have so much of support team that is automatically, you know, structured, uh, each one tries to play 
the expert's role. Like uh, Ryan said, the mother or Darima says, hey, you should have, you know, Dhoni, you know why he eats so many sixes? He, eat, he drinks two liters or four liters of milk every day. I don't know that. My mother told me that. Uh, and that's why you're not scoring. You know, and then you should be running. You know, my father said, every day in the morning you have to go run. Then only you'll be able to score runs. So each one, uh, you know, takes the place of the expert. Uh, right? And then you need to meditate. Then you become mentally tough. I mean, what you think when you're meditating, you're thinking of your failures more than anything else, then it's more damage. So, uh, so, so the coach, uh, I think, you know, if he recognizes that there's an athlete, a sportsman who is good, potentially has it in him or her, then he makes sure that he has the right people giving this kind of uh, input in all the areas, physical, mental, attitudinal maybe. So uh, the coach's responsibility is that. And then the parents, I think all coaches face this issue of the parents being overbearing. Uh, all well-meaning, uh, you know, parents, uh, but sometimes the expectations of the parents and then how it comes across as an impact on the athlete, the damage is huge. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's another area where the coach could see that the parent is coming in the way of the performance of the athlete, then the coach probably could intervene. I don't know if there is an expertise in the coach to do all of that, but at least they can identify that there are certain good people there uh, to mentor, to guide, you know, to make sure that the space, the environment for the athlete is there. You know, that's controllable. Performance is not, but this is controllable and the coach should make sure that all of these are in place. Thanks, Sajid. Before I open the discussion for the audience, Dr. Santosh, um, a question specific to Indian system. Uh, Self-medication and pharmacist prescribed medicines in India are quite common in the common problems in the medical system. Do you see similar issues in sports medicine as well? I think we do, but, <coughs> but I think that with increased awareness about uh, doping, anti-doping and the risks involved, I think there is a significant amount of awareness and my uh, first-hand understanding of that comes from my time with the uh, Indian hockey team. Uh, if you gave them any medicine, I, I, don't, I don't remember even one of them actually taking it, even though they were B-complex. And not something I gave them, but this is what the coaches used to distribute with their breakfast. They used to give them a B-complex. And they, I think they all went in the bin. So I think we've actually, to an extent, gone to the other extreme, where that fear of, you know, what am I taking has reached such an extent that a lot of them are actually not willing to take any medication, even if it might help them. If I can come in on, on this, uh, and this is a realization as a nutritionist, because you're taking something and, uh, you know, medicine is one part, and then he mentioned B-complex, which is actually coming from your vitamins, which is nutrition. And there's a very fine line there between I do not know, and I am scared, and I do not know, and then it is I know, but I want to cheat. So there are these, these three aspects. So the third one is doping. The, the one which is I'm scared, but I kind of know, and I don't know are two areas that we as, as experts, your foundation, as you rightly said, need to come together and make people aware that what is it that you can take? Uh, coaches need to recognize that uh, the medicine needs to be prescribed. Like somebody comes to me and says, I, I've got an inflamed joint. I'm like, go to your sports medicine doctor or go to your physiotherapist and ask them to prescribe you whichever product that is required, which comes not in the WADA band list. So they know that. So I think the athlete needs to have that support structure. When it comes to nutrition, like at Quan Nutrition, what we're doing, there's something known for the coaches out there, there's something known as the BSG, the banned substance group, I think it may have been mentioned in the morning, and informed consent. These are companies that send their nutritional supplements for testing and whether they are approved. And, and I know this BCCI does this very, very well. When I work with Shikhar Dhawan, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Is this, is this approved? Is this protein powder approved? Is this multivitamin approved? Like we, we had to give one athlete uh, a multivitamin without iron. And globally, I had to search at least around, I think I searched about, about close to about 600 products to get a multivitamin without iron in it, because this athlete was storing too much of iron, 
and then making sure that it was a banned substance. So yes, they will throw it in the bin. They will not take it and they'll go bear through the pain. So I think it's our job as coaches and medical experts to kind of bring up something, you know, as Go Sports Foundation is a ready resource, a helpline. You can call up somebody. These are the experts in this. These are the experts. Because that's what I'm facing in the last 10 years. People keep asking me, Ryan, can you refer a, a mind coach? Can you refer a good physio? Can you refer a good uh, doctor? I don't know where to go. And I'm at loss sometimes. I don't know who my counterparts are. So I think that's something that should come out of this panel discussion is, can you have a social media platform that enables all of these people to start talking and the rest of the world observes and then they can go and choose and, you know, can I, can I talk to this person? So then the B complex doesn't go in the bin and it's like, oh, B complex has been taken by everyone, so I can take this stuff. Thank you, Ryan. I open the discussion to the audience. If you have a question or a suggestion, please put up your hand. Our volunteers uh, will walk around with the mic. Good evening. I'm Dr. Sadla. I've been listening from morning sessions. Uh, sad to note that Sports Authority of India has been the butt of the main uh, focus and everybody is criticizing. But here, I would like to hi highlight the services given by my organization because it pains me a lot. They said contribution from Sai coaches doesn't come. Here, right now, I have three Olympic coaches in this auditorium who are silently listening to you. Mr. Gandhi, he has three Olympic probables. And Mr. <laughs> Chandarlal, he has been a coach of Indian national team. And Mr. Kumara, who has been a national coach for Indian volleyball team, which won the junior uh, championship uh, quarterfinals. So uh, the problem with SAI is it's a multitasking job. It's not exactly coaching job. They have to do other jobs also, even against that. And Mr. Ganguly Prasad was mentioned by Gopichan and Aparna Popat. And he's also from SAI. So we have people contributing. It's a vast ocean. SAI can only provide infrastructure facilities and training facilities. But for excellence, I think somebody dedicated should go on. That is one point. Second point, regarding sports sciences setup, we have a very good sports sciences setup and rehabilitation center. And we have athletes training from 12 years to 25, elite sports. Right now, we have national camps, people preparing for Olympics. Uh, Indian junior hockey team is training with all the facilities. And uh, regarding sports medicine in India, uh, Patiala has a sports medicine doctors. Medical Council of India has recognized two-year course. And there is MD sports medicine in Gurunanak Dev University in India. But again, the setback for sports medicine doctors is they are not recognized. Many of them, when they set up, come out in the practice in the private bodies, they are not encouraged. You know, any, everybody wants to get good remuneration. So they are not able to freely practice so much, sports medicine doctors. That is how it's suffering. And the understanding of sports medicine in sportsmen is also limited. They always think sports medicine means orthopedics. So this is the one thing said back. Otherwise, I think Sai is doing a good job. Uh, only in the thing is nutrition, we don't have a backup right now but but over here i can uh, attest in front of this audience she has invited me repeatedly to do seminars in sai which is the initiative by sai to enhance uh, nutrition education so i i applaud uh, you know all the coaches over here and also you dr sarla the initiative is there in sai so i, I really applaud you on that and right now our director general is very very positive on uh, sports science backup we are ready to do. But the only problem with SAI is a multitasking job to its employees. The coach will become suddenly the in charge, suddenly some government Modi's program comes, he has to go there. So it's a little tough, I do agree. But I wish SAI should not be put down so badly, it hurts us sitting here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you for highlighting the wonderful work that Sports Authority of India does. And uh, it's, it's a great opportunity even for us, uh, you know, if we can contribute to some of the work that you do. Thank you. Can 
in Mukesh Chetan here from Pro Sports. Uh, we were just uh, listening to Mr. Sujit regarding the mental training part. That at what stage does a child or a sportsman go to a mental trainer? We recently had somebody from Spain. We were talking in the morning regarding, you know, why everybody is running to Spain for tennis training. And he was conducting workshops here, level one workshops here. And the first thing he told us is that from the age of three years onwards, you start giving them mental training. You have physical, you have technical, you have tactical, and you have mental. Every single session that you do and start training, start training them from there. Not after they have had a problem at a match point, they have uh, you know, had a problem, therefore, now let's take him there because he's not able to win a fi final tournament. I would like your uh, comment on that, sir. Yeah, it was a great question and the answer also was given by you. In fact, like I said, uh, it has to be a support system. I mean, it has to be a structure where the uh, sportsman knows that that is one of the strongest pillars as well for performance. When you said physical and te technical, tactical, mental is also very important as a pillar for performance. And uh, that being the case, even at the young age, you can train them on aspects like focus and you know, confidence. I think, see, child sports psychology is also an, an area. Because kids, you know, uh, the, the society that we live in, the way we condition kids is that we reward kids. Even at home, we always compare the siblings, right? You know? so, uh, so because we are in that kind of a uh, you know, society, we, they need to know that uh, this is one area that they need to really work on. There are, there are many aspects. So, and of course, definitely when they start competing, of course, they have to know how to get better of the opponent, of the situation many times, about themselves, how they can manage their self-talk. Uh, so bet, better it is if it is done from the very young age. Thank you, Sujit. Sir, I am also from uh, Sports Authority of India. I was handling the national junior team for uh, almost a decade. Uh, my problem, I actually related with the psychology in relation with the point uh, raised by the uh, uh, colleague. We Indians like to lose the match towards the fag end. Where it matters, we lose. Even in cricket, I think you may be aware. League phase and all, we win. But there is no much pressure there. When we reach knockout stage, and when we reach 20 points in volleyball, in my sports, I'm telling, 20 we reach first than the opponent. From 20 to 25, we lose. What exactly it means, uh, I think maybe a psychological aspect, mental, there may be a blockage, because even in Sydney Olympics, our Indian hockey team lost in 45 seconds. We were playing with Poland. We have to win 1-0 India leading. In 45 seconds, we lost. Because we were supposed to play with Pakistan in semifinals in Sydney. That 45 seconds, we could not able to resist. Same way, I think today's Ranji, Karnataka Ranji team also, they should have selected, because I don't know what is the plan of a captain. They were opted uh, for uh, fielding instead of batting. Maybe they were, uh, they themselves uh, feeling, maybe, I don't know, uh, in cricket you are uh, better. But my sports, this is the problem. What exactly we have to focus? Because we never <laughs> accompanied the teams with the psychologist. No federation is taking. Uh, maybe exception is uh, nowadays cricket, hockey, and all they're taking. But, uh, Volleyball, nobody is coming, so, sports scientist. So how far coach can do? He cannot be a psychologist, he cannot be a, a, a nutrition specialist. A training can be given, a load, aspects he can see. But uh, coach, what way a scientist can help us, especially in this scenario? Okay, assume uh, the question is uh, directed at me. Uh, yes, uh, 
you know, the crunch time, that is when you are tested the most because the significance of the situation is so high. And whenever things are very significant, that's when, you know, the pressure mounts. Earlier stages, I mean, there's not so much significance to a loss. But then when you reach the final stages and, and then suddenly the athlete starts thinking, oh, oh my God, now I've already reached this stage and it is so very important that now I hold it together and then I perform. So, yes, so that's one of the areas that I also work on. Uh, it's important, I mean, it's a simple answer if I have to give you, then we help them focus on each, uh, you know, moment as just like when they started off. So focus on the process, not the result. I mean, like I said before, it's, it's a result-oriented culture and a society, uh, more so in India. Uh, so the win, the significance of a win plays on the mind of the athlete. It's so everywhere. I mean, in every aspect, when it is really at the final moment, the pressure is so high. Uh, so that's when it's very important. And many times, if you, sir, if you've noticed that, in, uh, it's not always the mental aspect as well, you know, because maybe the nutritional aspect is not there. If they are fatigued and if, and if they can't focus there, that also can add to it, right? I agree. So, and, and I, again, I talked in my talk about rates of perceived exertion. You know, when an athlete believes in training that they're training at 100%, and when we put the, you know, the mechanisms on them to, to find out actually what are they training at, and they're 25% lower than what they believe they are, you know, when, you, when crunch times come in difficult situations, like when we look at training athletes, we never really focus on our, um, you have really skilled athletes, guys with natural ability. You know, they're the ones you really worry about because they're the ones who breeze through everything as, as, as athletes and, and they've you know, done really well throughout their whole lives. They've never had knocks. They've never had failures because they've consistently been at the top of their sport. The guy that you want to watch, who, who you want to lean on at the time of trouble, is the guy that's had to work really, really hard to keep up with that guy. That's the guy you're going to focus on during, your, during these tough times, like you talked about those matches. They're the guys that are going to put their hand up at the end, because once they, they know what 100% is, they've worked at 100%, they know where their limits are. It's the guys who've only ever worked at 75%, Aramsa, you know, like, and, and because they're naturally gifted, when they're asked to go to the next level, they can't. And that's where failure comes into it. Now, that can be mental, and there's a direct correlation between the physical and mental training. They've never pushed it 100% in training, so they've never had mental durability. We know all the stats about that. Then the performance on the, on the nutrition side comes into it as well. You know, if they've never pushed themselves physically, they don't know what it's like to be sore. They don't know good pain from bad pain. They don't know what to expect during these times of ultimate exertion. And if their systems then fail them from a physiological perspective, they don't know where to go. So the mental is one part of it. There's a huge phys physical component here as well. But also that durability that we talked about, and I talked about it, where does that start? That starts at three, four, five, six in the playground. That's where durability starts, and that's where mental toughness first, first comes to the fore. If, if I can just complete this, I remember working with Gangli Prasad, sir, for when India won the Asia Cup. I think it was 2006 or seven, right? And we, we won the Asia Cup. And here's, here's the last fag end. Muscle glycogen is something that you need to look at. When you're playing continuous tournaments over a period of, let's say, six weeks, uh, the recovery of glycogen is over 48 hours, and you're, you're playing, they're practicing, so your reserves come down low, one. I've actually uh, monitored a play on vitamin B12 during a tournament. And at the start of the tournament, the, the, the play was at around 720. And by the end of the tournament, it had come down to about 300. It, B12 is a water-soluble vitamin. Hydration with which your glycogen, B12 I've lost. There are studies today not linked to sports. And I've, I've, I've been trying to ask my team, can we, can we start a paper on this? Uh, people who have lowered B12 levels have a different bacterial content and the probiotics then drop and it affects in a depression manner. So this has been found in bipolar schizophrenic, B12 affecting them. Can it be affecting an athlete by the end of a tournament when they're reaching the finals? Are their physiological reserves of the nutrients so low that whilst we're all saying mind coaching, mental coaching, 
is your physiological response creating one of flight instead of fight? So this is, this is stuff for hard, hardcore cutting research that we need to do. But I remember my experience in the Asia Cup. Those players were literally being fed by me and Ganguly, sir, opening their mouths at halftime and putting stuff in terms of amino acids, hydration, this, that, B-complex and everything. And the Japanese coach actually asked us, right, how did you get this level of fitness? So could it be fitness is the excuse? Because as John said, in the cricket match, they were at 75% of exertion during training and not at match level. So this match, they're really pushing the level, so physiological re reserves come down. And I think we train, we can train this nutritional debate, and this is, you know, I think this is a big one because I think this is where a lot of athletes fall down. If you train a system to only function on one fuel, you're going to fail. Simple. If you train your system to work on the most efficient fuel, then more often than off you, you'll succeed. And the classic example of that is the Australian cricket team and the South African cricket team over the last two years. Mitchell Johnson was the guy who changed, along with most of the guys, who changed their diets in a pretty radical manner. And the thing that changed most with Mitchell Johnson was his ability to still run in, which he couldn't do before, was run in at the end of the day and still bowl 150 kilometres an hour in that English series at the end of the day after 20 overs of bowling. And that's what separated those two teams for that tournament, was Mitchell Johnson's ability to, to continue to perform at that level at the end of a day's play and continue that into the next day's play because we changed the way his energy system functioned. And then we also changed, by doing that, how he recovered. Now, the athlete who recovers quicker and more efficiently is going to be better off from a performance perspective, from a cognitive perspective, from, from every aspect. Um, so I think the fuel system and then the influence on other systems in the body is something we need to investigate a lot closer because when push comes to shove, what is the one percenter that is going to make me better than that guy next to me? You know, why did, like you said, why did Kanataka, you know, fall over at the last hurdle? Why, did we, why have we fallen over at the last hurdle? Something is different. But if you can make changes and be open to change on, on these sorts of debates and these topics, then I think you're, gonna, then you're going a long way forward to, uh, to improving performance. But I think the diet one is something, and I touch on it in my talk, because I think we need to open our minds on this. You know, gone are the days where it's got to be all carbo load, this, that, that, you know, and Ryan will talk, about, talk to you about that as well. We have to be open-minded about what is the most efficient fuel for this athletic type and for this sport. That's where we've got to get smarter. Okay, uh, if I have to add to his question, I think he asked, uh, what should a coach do? I mean, you know, right? So I think from the physiological aspect, you heard them, you heard Ryan say that he, you know, he, he gave them fluids and hydration salts, make sure that they get that. And from the mental aspect, a coach should learn to, you know, ease the situation of a finals or final moments. I mean, if the coach is relaxed, doesn't make it too significant, then, you know, the, the players will be more relaxed. I think the coach should learn to not, high, you know, say, okay, it's the finals now, you have to do it, now come on. I mean, I think that will put more pressure. So as a coach, if he can relax, if his body language is a little more calmer, he's not pacing across. So if the, if the players see that the th situation and the environment is calm, then I think the performance will hold uh, through the finals and the final moments and the stages. And I think our bench, if you ever looked at a, a, an IPL dugout during crucial parts of matches, we always talk about energy from the dugout. When a player looks around, and he's the only, especially batsman, and they look around, not, they don't see anything on the field because there's no support there. The first place they look is at the dugout. Now, if they see a dugout that is negative, that, you know, they've got their head in their hands, um, or to the other extreme, they're overexcitable, it's amazing what message that sends to the middle in a cricket field. So you've got to remember that side is exactly what you're saying, is that sideline, um, uh, side visible sideline emotions dictate enormously what happens on the field. And that's, we were, we were, always, we were almost coached. One of the things that Paddy Upton always worked with us on was dug out, um, our dugout behavior because, because that reflects the state of mind of the whole team. So, and it does influence what the two guys in the middle are thinking as well. So you're spot on there. It's, it's great that you brought that up. 
some very interesting insights. I think the conversation is only getting better and better. We're really running short of time and we have to get ready for another event. Uh, we'll take one last question and then we'll wind up for the day. Yeah, hi. Question to uh, Ryan and John, actually. W what is the significant, uh, since you deal with junior athletes also, uh, there seems to be like, I think previously, like Zishan mentioned, that in the junior circuit we had such good talent. And like, for example, in tennis, the stuff that I, I, I teach tennis, we have had, uh, like, le maybe Leander Pays, Ramesh Krishna, all that win the junior Wimbledon, even singles, but somehow that didn't materialize in the, in the senior circuit. I mean, from the sports science point of view, is there anything that, you know, that we need to bridge to make that happen? Uh, so my experience now in the last decade has been this, that uh, we are starting nutrition too late. But that's, a, that's kind of antithesis to what you're saying. They're good at the junior level. What, what we're discovering and my team is discovering is that the growth hormone in a child athlete is always there to help you recover and take care as you start crossing into your 17, 18, 19s, growth hormone starts dropping. So your recovery is slower. So you see everyone starts off as single and they move into doubles and tennis. Why? Because the bodies are not able to take that sort of training load. That's one. Second is all these senior athletes start eating anyway because they're watching the other athletes. So they believe that that athlete's eating burger and pizza and he's at number one. Mind you, that one athlete is an outlier. So they think, okay, he's eating burger and pizza, so that's what got him there. So the kids then don't follow all of this. The nutritional discipline is not there. And uh, psychologically, uh, so I, uh, there, was, there was this doctor in Stanford, and she said, Ryan, the kid frames uh, adult eating behavior between the ages of 7 to 12, depending on the maturity of the kid. So if you can get the kid at that age, you can give them nutrition, and you prepare them for the senior level. But when this guy wins junior and then he comes to you when he's a 14, 15 year old, right? Uh, for, for example, I have a, right now I have a national champion. I won't take the name over here, tennis guy. Okay, he's tall and everything, but he's not listening to what I'm telling him. And I know for a fact he can go for greatness, but I'm saying, where's your beetroot? Where's your protein? Where's your fresh vegetables? And I called him up day before yesterday. Uh, oranges are very cheap. How many have you eaten? None, sir. How much fruit have you eaten? One banana. So. Where's, where's the fuel on a daily basis? So uh, that, that would be my, my take on we're able to produce junior because growth hormone is there. Senior, growth hormone has left you. Um, I, th I think there's a physical component. You can be the best technician in the world, but if you can't get to the ball to execute your skill, you're going to struggle. Um, and there are some athletes who, who, yeah, you'll get away with that until you sort of start hitting the, the, you know, the, uh, the, the sort of top 100 where you're really tested not on your technical quite often, it actually comes down to the physical. Classic example is the Indian, Indian hockey team in the 60s, 70s, 80s, completely dominated world sport. Technically the best was played on a surface that allowed them to be more one-on-one, -on -one, tactical, technical. Um, as soon as they turned, the turning point was when we changed to AstroTurf. As soon as they changed to AstroTurf, Indian hockey hasn't been seen since. The reason why is because the speed of the sport increased. Now, it allowed the less technical teams, the Australians, the South Africans, the English, who were fitter to get to the ball, create space, and have more time to execute their skill. That's what changed that sport. And it's the same in tennis. I've seen great tennis players who get to that peak. Again, naturally gifted athletes never really had to be pushed, just relied on their pure technical ability. As soon as they're asked to push themselves on the physical front, they've never made it. You know, and they've there are some outliers, there are a few guys like Jonathan Power, probably one of the greatest squash players that I've ever worked with, world champion. Unbelievable, never trained, ate exactly the diet that you just said, smoked 50 cigarettes a day, but he was a world champion. Now, he's a massive outlier, but he found what worked for him, and he found a coach that worked for him as well. As soon as they told him to go and do X, Y, and Z, that we felt that he should be doing, he failed. You know, so that's about knowing the individual as well. And again, what buttons to push on that individual. He's an exception. But in terms of sports where the physical versus the technical, um, once, you, once you've, uh, you're asked to go to the next level physically, it doesn't matter how good you are technically, you're never going to get there.
we'll have to wind up. Uh, Nihar has some points to mention. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, this uh, question is for our sports psychologist. Um, I fully realize that sports psychology is really, really important. And um, when you, and I found that if I were to send an athlete of mine to a psychologist when they have a problem, it's probably too late. And mind training is as important as physical or any other kind of training, and it has to go hand in hand. I completely understand that. What I found though, and this is, this is my question, do you feel that sports psychology needs to be sports specific? Because from time to time, um, I have sent my athletes to, to sports psychologists and sometimes the, the athletes just don't get it because the, the, the psychologist doesn't really know the sport well enough. And they come back to me and they say, you know coach, uh, when you, because I have a fairly deep insight into every aspect of the game, of, of the sport, of racing and everything that goes along with it. And sometimes, you know, the sports psychologist is really not hitting on, on the, right, the right points and not being very relevant to the, to the specific sport. So do you feel that, you know, basic um, uh, sports psychology is good enough at the absolute cutting edge at the elite level? Or do you feel that psychologists need to be more sports specific? That's the question. Well, um, it definitely helps for the sports psychologist to understand the sport because he can use the terminologies. But there are a lot of uh, generic sports psychology or mental toughness aspects that will hold good. Uh, see, that's when the coach could also come in handy because the sports psychologist or the mental tough conditioning coach should work with the skill coach. That will help uh, because he will bridge the gap. Because otherwise, you know, there are very few mental conditioning coaches and you can't expect these coaches to know the intricacies of every sport. But they will be adept at understanding the, men, uh, the, the challenges that an athlete at the elite level will be facing. It's uh, an expectation issue or the confidence issue or the fear of failure issues and all of those. But like you s rightly s identified, if he or she has to specifically identify at what moment of uh, the sport that the athlete is performing at, or which skill is, you know, uh, is challenging uh, the athlete, then it will definitely help. Uh, but you can't expect the sports psychologist or a mental conditioning coach to understand all sports at, at a level that he can make an impact. But, uh, but like I said, it's a, it's a team. Uh, maybe the coach should sit and, you know, when you work as a team, uh, the athlete might understand certain things that the coach has been talking about in terms of the uh, the, the, the terminology itself uh, of the sport, well, uh, you will have to work with the psychologist. It, it definitely helps when you understand the sport, but maybe you can't get... Uh, in India, at least, there are very few whom you can find. But the coach has to work with. Okay, this is related to your question. Uh, when Anirban uh, reached a certain standard of play where he had to play more in the US than here, uh, a lot of people recommended that he go and meet. I'm not going to put any names down because this is a very famous name. Written lots of books which are bestsellers and was asked to work with this sports psychologist who specializes in the game also. Uh, he did do quite a few sessions with him. Uh, and then we were at the US Open and I asked him, I mean he introduces, that guy was around, he introduced me to him and went away and I said, uh, don't you have a session with him? He said, it's not relevant. He didn't find him relevant uh, to his uh, needs. 
and i think it's also uh, something that is so personal uh, because you need to trust you know that relationship has to be built with the person that you're working with so when he said not relevant i didn't say anything i just kept quiet i said okay i understand what it is so a lot of this also has to do with you know the relationship that you build if that guy can't relate to you he can't break through that's one of the problems from my experience absolutely i think just to end this uh, the athlete should also find a uh, uh, an appropriate coach the coach can't be effective even if it is a skill coach or or a uh, mental conditioning coach i think uh, you know many times what a coach is can do good to one might not be the best coach for another you got to find the right coach for you because it's also a lot of rapport involved in that and also you know you need to work a, li a little longer with the person to be able to connect it's not a magic pill none, 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 none of these things are are so it has to be given a little more time um, and then take a call because not all coaches can make a difference to all kinds of like you mentioned a, an athlete who found the right coach for him which worked for him but that coach could probably not be as effective to somebody else i i also Good want policy. to add one thing i i i am with uh, nihar because i got my special training in australia with australian institute of sports there what i found sports specialist all the sports medicine nutritionist biomechanics are specific for the concern sports tennis nutritionist tennis biomechanic tennis psychologist like that they don't work with other people they are very 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 specific that's the reason those countries are doing very well in that particular sport whereas in india it's all generalized everybody working on everything that's the reason we are not able to utilize the sports uh, medicine subjects thank you very much sir uh, thank you to the wonderful panel today i mean it's been an absolutely enriching discussion it's a clear indication of what really can happen when we bring thought leaders in their domains and quality coaches under one roof and number of uh, things that can come out of it. Uh, we hope we get to do this more often. Thank you all once again for being a part of this panel. Thank you.